Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. I'm going to give everyone about a minute to join and get settled. As you're arriving, please go to the chat and say hello. We'd love to know where you're joining from, both your location and your school your organization, or if you're from a company, from your, your company. So go ahead and introduce yourself while we're letting folks join. See the ticker going up. Awesome. Great, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome again, if you're just joining us, please share your location and your entity you're calling in, in from on behalf of. So my name is Tristana Perkle and I am the program manager for the School Garden Support Organization Network or the SGSO Network as we call it for short. Today we're on our third webinar of the SGSO Leadership Institute Promising Practices uh, series, um, focusing in on equity inclusion in garden education. So to start, I'm gonna do some housekeeping. You could go to the next slide, please. This webinar and every webinar we do is recorded. You'll receive a link to the recording in the follow-up email and all recordings are archived on the webinars page of our website and the link is down below. We will be including on our website as well, a copy of the presentation so that you can have a copy of that after the fact. And we'll have about 15 minutes at the end um, for Q&A. The content of the webinar is a full hour. And then after that, we'll have 15 minutes at the end for Q&A. So as questions come up for you during the webinar, you can submit them via the Q&A section. Please use the Q&A section only for questions. Um, please don't put questions in the chat so that's really clear and easy for us to find and locate your questions. You can also see asked questions and we encourage you to upvote any questions you would like to see asked. So it kind of gives us a good sense of what everyone's questions are. And then at the end, please fill out the survey. We'd love to know what you think about the webinar. Um, a a pop-up window will, will populate in your browser and um, you'll also receive a link in the follow-up email. Great. So welcome, bienvenidos. Here is our agenda for today. I'll be sharing a bit of an overview of the network. We'll share where we're coming from, kind of framing up today's conversation. And then we've got our presentation, five specific topic areas within our general topic of equity and inclusivity in garden education. We'll dive into some scenarios to kind of display how you can use our new promising practices page. And then I'm sure lots of questions and hopefully some answers. So at the SGSO Network, we are a learning community of school garden professionals. We seek to connect, build best practices, and provide easy ways for you, the school garden experts, to ask and share information. We have three main avenues of peer-to-peer -peer opportunities. We have webinars, such as the one you're on today, where we provide a platform for SGSO leaders to share their expertise. We have in-person gatherings, including the Leadership Institute, um, the upcoming summit, as well as gatherings at other related conferences, and then our digital commons, which includes our, our website, where we organize new resources into our newly renovated and still in development promising practices page, our digital commons, which also includes our email list and Google forum. Google forum. If you'll go to the next slide um, to join either of our, our email list or our Google forum, you can go to www.sgsonetwork.org. Uh, forward slash connect. So who's here today? You all encompass a variety of different types of entities. The majority of you come from nonprofits and then the next largest group are school districts and school entities. There are over 300 of you um, coming from 43 US states, um, Canada and Germany today, that's who registered. And together, all of you support over 6,780 gardens. So now I'm going to pass it off to Whitney Cohen of Life Lab, our amazing partner for the Leadership Institute and so much more within our network. Thanks so much, Tristana. So as many of you know, and some of you have experienced firsthand um, at Life Lab here in Santa Cruz, California, we offer an, an annual Leadership Institute for School Garden Support Organizations. And we just had our fifth annual Leadership Institute in February and March of 2021. And um, surprise, surprise, it was virtual this year for obvious reasons. And so we, this was our first ever time hosting this in a virtual format. And you can see on this map here, 
all of the people from across the country who came together. And the presentation today is from working group C of that group. So everyone in the green boxes around the map, um, you can go to the next slide. Working group C came together for a week in March and we brought together kind of our practice, our our practices from our different SGSOs across the country. And we also looked at things that were submitted by many of you and many others in the SGSO network. And we attempted to sort of organize some of the most wonderful resources we could find on strengthening equity and inclusion in garden education. So out of that institute, um, each working group developed a webinar. So you're on this webinar now, but you can see the list here on the slide of the webinars that have already happened, which are archived, and also the webinar that will happen a week from now, which is on program assessment. And then each webinar is associated with a promising practices webpage. And so we'll be taking you to that webpage today, but just want to highlight that this really is due to the work of the amazing presenters who are going to share with you today. And then some other folks who are in our working group who are not presenting today, but you'll get to see on the webpage who those folks were. And it was such an incredible honor and, um, and kind of magical experience to work with these folks. So I'm so excited for them to share with you today. Next slide. I think that before I turn it over to Rebecca, the last thing I'll mention about the Institute is we're not sure where it'll go in the future, if it'll be virtual or in person or both, but all of it has been made possible by Whole Kids Foundation. So Life Lab in partnership with Whole Kids Foundation is able to bring all of these folks together and it's been really wonderful and we look forward to seeing where it goes in the future. All right, Rebecca. Thanks. Hi, Whitney. Thank you, Whitney. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Rebecca Lemos Otero. And first, I just wanted to introduce the team that worked on this, uh, creating this resource. So we have Fitzhugh from Oasis Farm and Fishery, Rebecca from Rogue Valley Farm to School, Diane from San Diego, Master Gardeners, uh, Laurel from Garden to Table. And then uh, included with them, we also have the people who will be presenting today, who you will um, get to hear from, who are Eva from Grow Pittsburgh, uh, Jesse from Nebraska, uh, the Nebraska Department of Education, Whitney, who you just met from Life Lab, as well as Judith, and then Tristana from the SGSO Network, and of course myself. Um, and as you can see from the map, what's really pretty cool is that when Life Lab and SGSO decided to do this, they got to put us together and we represent a lot of the country. So that was really neat to be able to come together and talk about our um, perspectives and experiences. Uh, next slide, please. And so uh, it is my turn to talk about our process a little bit and how we got to creating this resource. We thought that it would be important to um, express that a little bit because the, topics, the topic is you know, so complex. Um, so we thought that that would be helpful. So next slide, please. Uh, okay, so before we got started in uh, collecting resources, we thought a little bit about what is it that we wanted to do and um, accomplish with this. And so we thought about ourselves and who was in the room. Um, and just a few things we thought we, you know, we are, were a group of educators and we realized or, you know, um, decided that it was our responsibility and privilege to be proactive about our roles in creating these safe spaces for the kids and young people that we work with. And so in order to do that, what, did that, what does that mean? What does that look like? And more importantly, how do we do this? And there's a quote that um, I really like that is, says, if I didn't define myself, I would be crunched into other people's fantasies for me and eaten alive. And that's by Audre Lorde. And so we wanted to think about how can we reflect on our organizations and our styles in a way that makes sure that we create the safest space for kids to really be able to share every aspect of their identities um, and whichever aspects that they want and sharing them both individually and collectively. Um, and so we thought in order to do that, we really needed to be aware of ourselves. And for that purpose, that meant understanding our organizations as well and understanding how our organizations currently work what systems they work in and maybe what systems they support. Um, so we wanted to talk about that. And then we wanted to understand the work itself and just how complex and multi-angled um, an approach may need to be. Um, and I say all that because I'll talk later about the framework that we were able to create. Uh, next slide, please. So in addition to thinking about ourselves and who was in the room and what it was we wanted to accomplish, 
We also found these two things that were really helpful to us. That was the addressing framework um, that helped us think about what are the different uh, identities that we wanted to be aware of. And, um, and just understanding again, that when we're talking about this work and we're talking about identities, that they are complex and that they're multidimensional. And so how do we create a framework and resource and collect resources that try to express that? Um, we weren't always uh, successful in it and you know, are continuing to look for resources. And that is again, something where we would love your help in the future. And then as far as definitions, we you know, thought that it was important to take the time to really understand and have a common language. We recognize the language and terms can evolve concurrently with a progress and can change over time. So in order to kind of um, communicate with you what, our, what the definitions were that we were working with, we've included them in the resource and they're definitions that were shared with us and made public by uh, Youth Outside, who you'll keep hearing about. They're a really fantastic resource. They're awesome. Uh, next slide, please. So, I'm about to dive into the resource itself, but I just wanted to say that we took this, I, you know, this conversation about ourselves and what we wanted to accomplish, these definitions and this guiding framework, and we created our own framework and something, you'll see this image um, on screen that Houdit called our learning wheel, which I thought was really fantastic. So if we click on the um, link, we can show you the actual website. Fantastic, thank you, John. And so this is the actual website and it's live and you can click on it now and follow along with us or you can you know, look at it during the presentation or after. But um, this is where all of our stuff ended up. And so if you scroll down a little bit, um, you'll see our table of content. Um, but then if you keep scrolling, please, you'll see the overview, which asks some of those questions um, that we asked ourselves. And then if you go down here, are the key terms and here are the definitions and you can click on each of them. And that's the full definitions that we worked with. Um, so we definitely invite you to take time to look at those and to use them and definitely to give a shout out to youth outside uh, if and when you use them. Uh, keep scrolling, please. And then, so here's the idea of how to use this resource and here's the learning wheel and the framework. What we realized was that people are gonna to come to um, talking about equity and equity work from different angles within the organization, right? And most likely a lot of times we come to it thinking about external relationships. You know, How can our program connect with kids more? Um, and how can we have stronger community connections? And we realized that we also needed to reflect inwardly. So in this learning wheel, you'll see, and uh, throughout the rest of the presentation, you'll see that there's five categories that we worked with. So organizational learning, which is the actual, you know, what does the organization need to know to be able to do this work? That's fantastic timing. Awesome. Uh, sorry about that. Um, or, organizational leadership. Uh, and that's the board and any of the leadership team, team culture and structure. Um, collaboration with community and liberated learning spaces for youth. And so how do all these things combine together? Uh, so then if you scroll down a little bit more, you'll see that in each section, we have created a section for each category uh, with a description of what we were thinking. And then the resource section, if you click on that, shows all the resources that we have found. And so each um, resource has a link and a description as to what it was, um, what it's about. And so there are a ton of resources in there and we definitely, definitely invite you to explore them. And they're resources from all kinds of people all over the place. Uh, so it's pretty fantastic. Uh, thank you someone who noticed or commented on pet and appreciating my pet right now because you do um, and I may not. So and then moving to categories. Uh, thank you, John. If we can go to the next slide. Also. <laughs> uh, if we can go to the next slide. Great. I'm going to introduce Jessie and put myself on mute and she's going to talk about the first category. Thank you, everyone. It's going to take just one sec for it to uh, reload and get into presenter mode working from Google Slides.
Is this where you want to be, Jesse? One more. Thank you. So uh, like someone mentioned earlier, uh, my, my name is Jesse Coffey and I work at the Nebraska Department of Education. And we have actually uh, dove into the, some of this work of thinking about and strategically um, implementing equity and inclusion within our state agency over the last year and a half. Um, and there, there's definitely a lot of lessons learned that we used as we had a discussion about what resources and tools we would want to include. Um, things that um, I had, wouldn't have thought had been would you know be sticking points or um, challenges for others within our organization. So um, many of the tools outline some of these best practices that I'll talk about, but we found some of these to be effective and then also sort of highlight a little bit about what didn't work and we could possibly do better. So definitely as you begin this journey um, of implementing equity and inclusion across your system, really look at taking that, that systems lens, um, looking at HR practices and things like that, that um, the next group will talk about a little bit more, but um, the, it, it's all included within your system. So everything within your organization. Um, so in a way to make it a fairly neutral process, it's important to invite an external um, facilitator with the expertise in facilitating this conversation because talking about and really being critical about your systems change, it's a, this a very personal process that, that you're undertaking um, here. Um, when, there you go. Um, and so it's important to use sort of that outside organization that does possess that um, expertise and talking about um, how you go about systematically changing your processes. Um, and then in the second step, it's really important um, to prepare your team to think about personal bias as a first step and just being very transparent about that this will require some personal work. If you've never had an opportunity to really think about in a very um, subjective way, or I guess really more an evidence-based way about what equity and inclusion means. And maybe as a white person, what it what it means that you've always been included, but there's a many other people that haven't been. And really trying to frame it as being very open and honest and really looking at it at a different lens than you maybe ever have. So we did do some pre-work, um, but it was, um, as we all are very busy within our organizations, oftentimes, um, I would say that it's something so important that you need to send two or three reminders um, and then some have some of it be um, videos versus some of it be reading so that there's uh, you're appealing to different learning styles. Next slide, please. So I, it's really important and we see that we'll see this in the resources as you dig into some of the um, tools that we found, but really ensuring that you prepare for um, discomfort around some of these conversations around some people who will feel like that they they are very equitable um, and that they're that's kind of where we should end and, and talking about equity and equality um, and, and how those are different. Um, really having a conversation about white fragility um, and then also being cognizant about that we don't place the onus of this process on people of color within our organization if that isn't what they feel comfortable in doing or want to move forward. Um, and then establishing really a way to um, have a team atmosphere so that you are all learning from each other. And I think what we learned from our experience, one of the most powerful things that um, was hearing lived experiences from our, from our coworkers about um, situations that their children had been in that are you, you, you just, you, those lived experiences are just things that you can read them in a paper or in a document, but hearing that your coworkers have had to experience this or their children or their husband, there's just nothing more impactful than, than those stories. And then not everybody is going to speak up and share. So make sure you give um, and plan for space for all personality types. So if you have those um, verbal folks, that's great. Let them share that way. Otherwise use things like um, Jamboard or a whiteboard or the chat, ask them to share through that and then have your facilitator um, reiterate their experiences. And then use polling, which is a more um, covert way to, to get information from the group about where they feel um, they're at about the conversation and the suggestions that are being made to move forward. Um, and that really helps um, gain everyone's perspective in a non-judgmental manner. Okay, next slide. 
And so as you look through the resources that we've created, um, many of them will work to help get everybody on the same page. And um, under the under our section, um, the resources, the toolkits um, that we have listed here. So equity work within our organizations. And then um, the second one, the toolkit for operate, opera, really, I can't say that word right now, um, including equity. That is really for more of a governmental perspective or, or and, and it applies a lot to nonprofits as well. So we're gonna watch just a little bit of this video to really have her explain um, why it's important that we, we have this conversation. Before we can talk about equity versus equality, I wanna first define diversity. At Inclusive Communities, we like to say diversity in its simplest definition means differences. We all have differences from our glasses to our weight to how much money we have. That is diversity, and no matter how much people say it's hard to find diversity, that's not true. Diversity exists. It's about taking the time to acknowledge its existence and work to ensure action is taken to embrace these differences, not alienate them. Equality is often equated to fairness and sameness, and is based in the misconception that we all have the same needs and the same solution will work for everyone. Equity is based in access and opportunity with the understanding that we each start with different advantages and disadvantages, and thus have different needs to attain access and opportunity. To understand equity, we have to compare it to equality. Now, I love this equity versus equality graphic as it's- So that was a really, that's an example of a, of a good pre-work um, video that you could share out and have your um, folks look at um, to get an understanding of um, the differences. So this image, and you've probably seen these before, um, and there's lots of different ones on the um, internet, but it helps visualize and understand um, these various concepts um, as utilizing inequities, um, which I think it's great to start there because I think we've all heard that, but then really diving into the equality, um, which is giving everybody kind of the same thing, even though their needs are different. And then looking at um, equity, which is that more tailored support and then building up from their justice. So you could use this image as a um, way to help people see where you're headed um, and have a clear conversation um, within your group about, about how you think about and look at um, equity and diversity in your organizations. Um, again, there's a lot of great resources out there, but we kind of spent a lot of time going through them and looked at what was um, most purposeful in the organizational space. And that is all I have. Great, thanks, Jesse. So um, another topic that we covered um, for our resources is leadership. So embedding equity and inclusion into the organizational leadership. Um, and um, we were really passionate about this. Rebecca and I ended up being the ones to like hone in on this topic. And I think it worked out really, really well in the way that we paired off and, and figured out who was gonna do what components of this to compile. Um, but as Rebecca and I were facilitators for the week-long um, uh, participation, um, we ended up with leadership. So I thought it worked really well. Um, yeah, so we were thinking of um, that, like, why would this be something that we're passionate about? And we've really understood through all of the different places we worked and the places where we have had these different roles, we've realized that leadership has a very... Uh, it, has a very, very important place in that it can change a lot of large structural things. And so it can make adjustments in these um, larger picture things. Leaders create these sort of spaces that have for any organization could change the feel, could change the culture of a space that people are working in. And so it's re really important to make sure that leaders are encompassed in this sort of developing, changing, evolving sort of spaces. And so we broke it down into four categories, as you can see here um, on the darker green side. Um, we broke it into a category of like creating centered, um, equity centered strategic planning and implementation processes. So like making sure, right, every step of the way in that leadership sort of way um, that we are thinking of equity. We also thought of engaging board and leadership 
um, and then uplifting youth voices in this leadership sort of spaces. And then also rethinking fundraising and where uh, finances are managed. And so we had these guiding questions that helped us to, to hone in on what sort of resources we should be finding in order to find the best, most effective um, support systems resources out there. And so, for example, for the um, engaging the board and the leadership for number two, we thought a lot about how do we build inclusive, representative, and proactive board, um, and things like how do you strengthen your own leaders in their biases and their blind spots, or how do how do they pay attention to their blind spots and their and their biases without it being harmful to the organization. Um, Another one that was really that really stood out to us was the rethinking fundraising and finances is because we realized that through all of our search, um, there was not a lot out there as how to be more creative, more transformative in the way that we are fundraising and in the way that we are thinking of managing money. And so we started asking questions about like, how do we include significant thought around this or discussions around fundraising practices, language, where are the potential funders coming from? Um, what are your funding goals and how are those decisions are being made? Um, and then I also really, really loved, um, yeah, really loved how we need to also think about number three, where you're uplifting youth voices. So how are we creating these pathways where power can be given and handed off to the next generation in a much more equitable way? What are the pathways, support systems, who needs to be in the know, who needs to be in the room in order to make these pathways, these possibilities much more attainable, much more equitable, to all of us um, and starting with youth and including youth in these higher level thinkings, higher level place um, in an organization. And if you move to the next slide, thank you. Um, just to highlight another um, like visual, I'm a really visual learner. And so I love seeing these map uh, drawing kind of ways of understanding things. One of the resources that we were able to find in that leadership category. So when you go to the website and you go under that second category of, or second topic of leadership, and you go under the category that is for youth in leadership, you can find this through Q, what is it? Cunity, it's like the letter Q and then unity, um, has uh, this great map showing like what all are the all of the different resources that need to be put in place to support youth as they grow as they develop who they're in contact with who they're participating with who are the people that need to be a part of their lives to make these sorts of steps along the way so that they can be in these leadership roles when it when they're ready and when it's time and helping the leadership as they're in their roles right now um, to make this a much more equitable space as we move along. So that's the leadership section. I'm gonna pass it off to Tristana for the next one. Thank you. Great, thanks Ava. So I'm diving into team structures and team culture and how those two interact to influence equity and inclusivity to allow for diversity within an organization. Um, the reason I personally think team structure and culture is important and why I was drawn to work in this section with my colleague at Garden to Table, Laurel Smith, is that I believe that working on these two components really prevents equity and inclusivity from being becoming just a side project and helps us all to develop into the culture that pervades all that our organizations do. In other words, the um, allows for the effort to kind of start at home first. And so what we came to find in our exploration is that culture and structure are constantly reinforcing each other and at time and, and at times are hard to disentangle. So an equitable and inclusive team structure, you know, such as time off policies, meeting agendas, creates over time an equitable and inclusive team culture, assumptions, shared beliefs, feelings, and then that culture reinforces the team structure and allows for it to be maintained and evolve over time. 
And so this image of the iceberg is a helpful illustration of what team organizational culture could include. And the analogy of the iceberg really helps to illustrate that it's important to really dive into, um, you, know, the, you know, because like an iceberg culture and the structures that uphold it have a couple of things that are pretty obvious at a quick glance or on the surface, but include even more things under the surface um, that are covert or unspoken. So when it comes to organizational culture, the things that we often see and focus on are, you know, vision, strategy, goals, procedures, structures, all very important things. But there are also a number of things underneath the surface to work with, such as values, unwritten rules, feelings, shared assumptions, uh, perceptions, beliefs, stories, that kind of thing. Um, so when we talk about culture and structure, we seek to include all of these things. So if you go to the next slide, when we dove into the aspects of team culture and structure, we have identified four main subcategories um, to help us as organizations explore this topic. And I will say that there are many different ways to think about and organize this topic. Uh, and we found a lot of the resources covered a variety of these subcategories in a variety of ways, but this is just how we wrapped our heads around it and organized it. So first, we felt it's best to start with an assessment or an evaluation of our organization, kind of identifying our commitment to equity and inclusivity with questions like, you know, who are we as an organization? Who makes up our staff culture? Who's present? Who's missing? Where are we at? How can we grow? And then next, for number two, we can develop a vision and a vision and mission that centers inclusion, equity, and justice, and centers youth voices. For that particular piece of youth voices, you know, being organizations and schools that support children and youth, a core component to living out these values is to go ahead and center those we are serving, you know, as we're planning our, our organization. And then from there, kind of identifying the goals to help us live out this mission and vision in our organizations. From number three, we can then kind of look at the work environment at the organization. You know, questions like, how do we maintain a supportive staff experience? How do we retain staff? How do we provide space for staff to show up in their full selves and take care of themselves? You know, essentially, what does it feel like to work here? Are there ways we can grow in making the organization more supportive for those who work here so that they can live out the values of equity and justice and the work that they do? You know, this could include recruitment, feedback mechanisms, staff support, and gratitude. And then finally, we look at how, how is power shared and how is leadership developed? What's the team structure? How do we develop staff and create clear pathways for growth and development, leadership and power sharing? Are there opportunities for mentorship? Essentially, what are the structures to allow for continual power sharing to be implemented and maintained over time so that new leaders are constantly evolving, thereby just kind of allowing for that to, to kind of live throughout how the organization is created and evolved over time. So within these subcategories, there are or a variety of things to look at and dive deeper into, but hopefully this gives you an idea of what it, what it would look like to tackle an inclusive and an equitable team culture and structure. So next, I'm gonna pass it off to Lauren. All right, thank you so much, Tristana. So hi everyone, my name is Lauren Newman and I had the opportunity to work with Rebecca Slosberg from Rogue Valley to compile our resources for the category, um, collaborating with community through partnerships, program development, and assessment during this year's SGSO Leadership Institute. I personally was immediately drawn to this category because I have been a part of seeing the power of community-informed programming firsthand long before I started in my role as the Youth Entrepreneurship Cooperative Program Manager at City Blossoms just over a year ago. Um, well, and that's, that's because I grew up in DC and I had my first garden experiences with City Blossoms in one of their community green spaces when I was just 10 years old. And it didn't take long for me to fall in love with gardening because well, if you've never been to any of their spaces, the only way to describe it is magical. But even more than that, it is the investment that City Blossom shows in maintaining um, long-term relationships with community members and participants that makes that experience, in my experience, special. Um, year after year, folks come back and they share the space with their family and friends 
because City Blossoms designs the space with community in mind. I don't think it truly clicked for me how special this was until I started working on my senior thesis for college in the summer of 2017. It was during this summer that I had the opportunity to work with the youth you see pictured on this slide. Um, and that was that year's cohort of Mighty Green summer youth staff. As a program centered, um, centered on the concept of cooperative ownership, the Mighty Greens youth took a leading role in shaping the program and their business for their peers, laying and strengthening the foundation for future Mighty Greens members still to come. That summer, I learned that these young people were my teachers and we were learning and building the program together. This experience really solidified my belief that garden-based programs have to be built by the community for the community and informed the background that I brought with me while defining and shaping this category with Rebecca. Um, so next slide, slide please. So just to begin, we, we both agreed that a major key to the success of any school garden support organization is community buy-in. This means that with every new project, it is ideal to have community members involved at every stage of the process, from before the ground is broken to many seasons after a garden has been established. We identified some strategies for initiating um, collaborative community partnerships, which included um, showing sensitivity to the community and its residents by waiting until an invitation is given or permission is granted before providing services, compensating community members for sharing their time and expertise, and cultivating shared ownership of, of the space, just to name a few. We also believe that collaborative community partnership is strengthened by ongoing reciprocal relationships that foster safe and inclusive space, spaces that acknowledge the diversity of needs represented. Lastly, we identified the importance of ongoing assessment of program impact um, and that need for it to be accessible and community centered. So in defining the subcategories for this section, we grouped our resources under four themes, which you can see pictured in the darker purple on the left. Um, number one being honoring community knowledge and voices. Number two, uplifting youth voices. Number three, integrating community collaboration into program development. And four, hearing community voices in impact assessment. The resources under the first subsection help us answer key questions such as, how do we establish and sustain trust amongst key community partners? And how do we ensure accurate representation of community voices? We decided not to lump uplifting youth voices in the first theme, because even though youth are definitely a part of the larger community that we strive to honor in collaborative partnerships, we wanted to take special care in choosing resources um, specifically designed to uplift youth voices because they are too often discounted as naive or uninformed non-experts, despite the fact that they have been leading the intersectional environmentalist movement. By uplifting youth voices, organizations gain a greater diversity of perspectives to inform partnerships and programs. So the third theme, um, integrating community collaboration into program development um, was informed by our understanding that community collaboration requires both initial outreach to ensure that the community voice is being heard as well as ongoing communication and effective partnership in program development stems from community members being given the opportunity to express desires and concerns. And then finally, our fourth section and fourth theme, hearing community voices and impact assessment, identify some strategies for building assessment tools that are both accessible and culturally relevant. Um, and we believe this to be important because it can provide more honest input from the community and ensures that the lived experience of community members is reflected in the program impact assessment. So I hope that like gives you just a little taste of what this section of the resource guide holds. 
Um, and I'll go ahead and pass it along to Eva and Hudit to share the final category. Thanks, Lauren. Yeah, and thanks, John, for moving on the slides. Um, yeah, so Hudit and I are going to present this last topic on uh, liberating youth and professional development. Um, and it was Fitzhugh and Diane who really um, put their energies and focus into this section. And so it was really exciting to hear from them that their great like motivation for for choosing this area to really hone in on had to do with really understanding that where children are, where teaching is happening in the classroom um, and all of the educational sort of things that happen in and out of the classroom to youth are really, really formative of what's going to really exciting of how children are going to see the world and how they're going to participate in the spaces that we are. And so focusing on youth professional development and in a liberating lens is really, really exciting. And so they came, we came up with um, these four categories um, to work under. Uh, one of them was the developing liberatory uh, teachers and staff. The second one is teaching styles and pedagogy. So how the teachers are teaching, uh, the students, how are they collaborating and working together? What is being set up for them in order to create this learning sort of space? Uh, number three was the liberatory curriculum and activities. Like, so what are we focusing on? And then uh, number four, building liberatory spaces. So the physical space. Um, so Hudi, if you want to talk more about like what brought us there, that would be awesome. Thank you, Eva. Yes, uh, thinking about uh, youth is really important and youth we're really defining in very broad terms. It's actually children all the way to young adults. And so thinking about that entire um, path uh, or pathways as Eva was mentioning is really important. And the needs that, that youth at different stages have and then the community around them as well. As Eva was noting, and you'll see it in our resources, really thinking about the developing the, the professional development of the people that are actually uh, educating, training uh, youth again at the various different levels and really thinking about how do we as trainers or educators really begin to listen to young voices. And whether that's a child who is questioning, hmm, you know, are there any teacher, are there any teachers who are, you know, Asian American in my community or African American or Latino, or they're talking about identity, listening to their questions and being really open to uh, providing spaces within the classrooms and within the outdoor spaces in terms of being able to ask questions. So those are liberatory spaces. It's spaces where we can all have conversations that make us sometimes feel uncomfortable, but that we could feel that children are both empowered to ask those questions and explore. And so being able to have um, the, all, everybody around them ready for those questions and be able to, to listen to what children and young adults are experiencing. Being able to also model um, ways that power dynamics, we were talking about shared leadership, whether that's within an organization, whether that's within the classroom, or whether that's again in a, a farm or garden setting. How do we share um, decision-making, whether it's ground rules on how we're going to have a conversation or designing, you know, those guiding principles on, um, you know, the, the, for the day or for the classroom, being able to have young voices be part of that decision-making process, being able to have them take on more responsibility as well. Um, and also being able to use storytelling and games, ways that, that are various different ways of learning even about um, liberatory spaces and, and liberatory ideologies as well. And so being able to think about, in addition to that, how do we bring curriculum, curriculum that is allowing for the questioning, the exploration and the challenging as well. Sometimes, you know, we have to be ready as we open up those spaces to be challenged 
uh, by young people um, and being able to um, have the actual physical spaces be thought of by young people and, and children and have them be part of that design framework, um, whether it's you know size or whether it's thinking about circles rather than, than um, classroom styles that were traditional, those kinds of spaces can make a real big difference when we're all looking at each other versus being able to look, being looked at. And so um, we are really looking at how um, even to talk about liberation, which may be a new word for some of us, how do we even talk about that? What does that mean? And so to talk about liberation is also to talk about oppression. Well, what is it, you know, how are we talking about oppression and how do each one of us experience it from various different perspectives? As, as the, the group looked at this, uh, there are some incredible resources that we highly recommend you go to in terms of the website. Um, and in particular, in terms of the curricula, we thought it was really important to see that there are many resources for many different communities. One of the areas that we thought could be a, a place where you guys can all help us, where you all, I should say, where you all can help us is to bring in um, more curriculum that focuses on uh, Asian American, the Asian American experience and Pacific Islanders, the Latino or, or um, some people would say Hispanic, Latino or Latinx experience in terms of um, curriculum within school gardening. And so there are some wonderful resources for, for Black and African Americans for early childhood education, also for indigenous and native learners, LGBTQ learners. But we do see that there is still an opportunity to, to include more. And again, as others have mentioned, this is a living document in terms of our SGSO um, promising practices. And we welcome and invite you all to uh, share some of your resources. So with that, thank you. Uh, we are going to um, move forward and pass it on to, ah, actually, John, could you move one more slide up? Thank you. This is a resource that Rebecca mentioned before, and it's Youth Outside. It's one that we at Life Lab has, have used. We think that Youth Outside is an important example to highlight, to celebrate, and to reference, and to seek, and to contract with, uh, to learn more about both creating liberating spaces for youth, but profession, the professional development for organizations as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to Rebecca. Thanks, Vivi. Um, next slide, please. So we're going to take a moment, um, or the last part of this webinar, to kind of play out some scenarios and highlight some resources that we thought would be helpful in those scenarios, just to you know um, start getting into the material a little bit. So next slide, please. Um, so scenario one is strengthening organizational structures to build internal equity. So let's say, and we've, I've heard this story you know, multiple times, so you're an organization, uh, part of an organization, preparing to create its next strategic plan. And it recognizes that some of its practices are passively or actively hindering more equitable culture and impact. And so I've definitely talked to lots of people, lots of organizations who are like, this is where we're at, you know, what, what do we do and how do we change? And if you're, you know, in the process of doing a strategic plan or before one, it's a great time to reflect and pivot. Um, and sometimes people, you know, thoughts that we've heard people share are, you know, our board just doesn't know where to get started or our organization is not truly representative or rooted in the communities that we work with, or we don't have the money uh, to include more equ equitable practices. You know, all these kinds of things kind of come up and so if you go to the next slide, please. If that's the conversation you're having and those are kind of those big issues that come up and you're like, we don't even know where to start because you know, this is a problem that feels so big. Okay, let's start breaking it down. So we're about to do our strategic plan for our organization. Um, and here's some tools that might be able to help us along with the conversation and then with um, figuring out some outcomes that work for your organization and your community. So the first one I'd like to highlight is um, going back to that idea of learning together. The Organizational Race Equity Toolkit um, from Washington Race and Equity and Justice Initiative is a really great toolkit to start asking questions first and trying to figure out 
you know, hmm, we realize that we could be stronger in equity work in our organization, but we don't exactly understand what that would look like or what that means. This is a, a document that kind of helps you ask those questions the same way we have been throughout this whole process to, um, to start kind of thinking about what are the areas that you want to focus on. And then you might say, well, you know what, in, in our strategic planning, what we've come to realize is that our board could be more inclusive, representative, and proactive. What can we do around that? And so the governance gap, uh, examining diversity and equity on nonprofit board of directors is a really great tool to um, better understanding how important it is to have a board of directors that really is connected to the communities that you're working with and whatever that connection means, whether it's representative um, or participatory within the community. Um, and so this, this report kind of helps show how much of a problem this is throughout nonprofits in general. And so kind of helping someone, you know, you and your team figure out, okay, this is beyond us. This is a bigger problem. Let's be part of the solution. So I found it really helpful for that. And then there's organizations that exist like the Green Leadership Trust that specifically are helping with board recruitment. Green Leadership Trust um, is help, helps with connecting uh, BIPOC self-identified uh, professionals with nonprofit uh, environmental and food-based uh, organization boards. So there's people out there who are really excited to help make those connections. And then we're, you know, you're thinking, okay, that's fantastic. We've thought about our board, but now we want to think about um, other parts of the organization. So education outside has a, a list of resources that have been really fantastic and trainings and ideas for trainings to get the organization talking about its culture. Um, and then, you know, as you've heard all of us talk about uplifting youth voices, you know, we believed that that was one of the most important things in really talking about this work. And so how do we create pathways of power um, within the organization? And so Rainier Valley Corps uh, also wrote a fantastic paper that they put together sharing a fellowship program that they designed. That was specifically a fellowship to um, strengthen leadership and create leadership opportunities for young people of color um, to do more environmental justice work. And so if we play with all these resources, right, and you're at the beginning of talking about your strategic plan, you've now laid out all these conversations to be able to lay out a plan that says, okay, what is going to be our pathway to power? Do we create a fellowship program? Um, I, we did in our organization back a few years ago, and that has been really fantastic. Um, and maybe in our strategic plan, we're going to create something where our leadership and our board starts thinking about um, ways to be more inclusive and writing that into a strategic plan. So then now you have a, a path or a roadmap that you know dictates for the next three to five years, maybe a way to move forward through, through this work. And so I'm gonna stop there because I feel like I've given you lots of little things to play with um, and start thinking about, and I'm gonna pass it to Hudit, who's gonna give you kind of a real life example. Yes, Rebecca, thank you. So I have the pleasure of, and the honor of working at Life Lab. I've been here for two years and at Life Lab, and John, if we could forward one, one forward, one slide, thank you. Um, Life Lab is um, turning 42 this year and we are continuing to learn. And I have to say just as a beginning, if we would have had this learning wheel two years ago when I started, I think um, it would have been a tremendous help. So I just wanna to continue to encourage you all to look at, at both the, the resources that are available and to begin to think about how all the various different components intersect to make a stronger organization to really build that internal um, equity uh, muscle. Um, last year, something really significantly happened for LifeLab. And that is we not only were looking at developing a strategic plan, but thinking about a theory of change and thinking about really the communities that we serve because we are both local and national. And those are very, sometimes very different communities. We're in Santa Cruz uh, off the coast of, of California where it is prim uh, the community that we work with is primarily a Latino, Latinx community, agricultural community. And yet our staff two years ago was not reflective of the community that we were serving. And that is a big moment for us to realize, ah, 
something is, that we can, we can do something about. Um, I was invited to come in and then the pandemic happened in 2020. And at the same time, so I am a co-director and that alone already says that Life Lab is a courageous organization. Uh, it's an organization that's creating learning spaces for us to imagine how sharing of power could be different between a co-director who is a white man and a white, I mean, a Latina, some people would say racially white, ethnically Hispanic Latina X. I identify much more with indigenous. So there you go in terms of identity, uh, all of the complexities. But in terms of thinking about the organization, something also really significantly happened. And that is we were learning, unlearning and relearning thanks to a conversation that opened up nationally. And that's a racial conversation. Uh, thanks to the protests that were happening around the country, it really got us thinking internally, how do we learn about anti-racism? How do we each individually and as an organization begin to develop ways of learning and thinking and questioning and having these spaces, some people would say safe spaces, brave spaces, spaces where we can question what we've been doing and how we've been doing. And we've been very fortunate that we were able to um, have our funder, Packard Foundation, fund a consultant to help us. And we are in the middle of it. We are right in that center of the learning and the thinking about our board and thinking about new voices. In fact, we uh, hired for the first time eight AmeriCorps fellows and they are part of all of our conversations. They have actually helped us to mobilize our thinking and mobilize our own questioning. And so some of the things that we highly recommend is take a look at these resources Think about how leaders, how nonprofit leaders can begin to ask themselves those questions that then opens up broader conversations and also bringing in external help to guide some of those conversations and then sharing. And so we are here sharing and we'd love to, to share with you our, uh, what we call Jedi's learning journey, justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, and solidarity. And it is a story still unfolding, but we are hoping that the work that we do can benefit not only Life Lab, but garden programs. And you'll hear the music of my teens in the background. So thank you. And now I will turn it over to Laura. Thanks so much, Yuki. Um, so I'll, I'll present our second and last scenario. Um, having culturally responsive con conversations in the garden classroom. So I'll just begin by saying that gardens can be a powerful space for having courageous conversations that acknowledge and directly address the past and current historical connections between race, class, and our food system. So imagine with me here, it's a hot late summer day and you are facilitating a lesson in the garden with a group of teens. The racial makeup of the youth is pretty mixed, but you have a group of black students cracking jokes about feeling like slaves working out in the summer heat. You want to use this as a teaching opportunity to reframe the conversation about food sovereignty, but you don't even know where to begin. When we directly address scenarios like this one, we can turn an uncomfortable or unsettling situation into a learning opportunity that promotes healing and meaningful action. But where do we even begin in creating a safe space to have meaningful dialogue to address these difficult topics? Well, we can look at what our resources have to offer. So next slide, please. Um, well, first off, you might find section four, collaborating with community through partnerships, program development and assessment and section five, creating the learning environments that liberate youth, particularly useful in developing the skills you and your team need um, to, to facilitate culturally responsive conversations in the garden classroom. For example, the article Liberated Roots, um, which is gonna be linked in category five in the subsection on building liberatory spaces highlights the work of three garden activists as case studies of promising practices we can implement to build more inclusive and equitable garden spaces that uplift youth voices. And if you're struggling to find a way to hold the space for these courageous conversations, you might want to check out the compilation of liberating structures in category four 
um, in the subsection on honoring community knowledge and voices. Um, so that's pictured in this middle, in the middle image of this slide right here. Um, and liberating structures are a series of interactive activities that facilitate dynamic responses to problem solving. And then if you need to back up a few more steps, um, this is why this resource is so great, um, because it really will meet you where your organization is in your learning journey. Um, if your organization is in need of a definition of culturally responsive teaching, um, this document on the right um, from Food Core might be a good place to start. And that is also located in category five in the subsection teaching styles and pedagogies. Um, so in, in addition to providing the reader with a definition of culturally responsive teaching, it also highlights the behaviors and practices that we should strive for when building a culturally responsive garden classroom. Um, so this is just three resources. You saw the page. There's literally like probably dozens. Um, uh, this is just a small sample of the plethora of resources we've been able to compile for SGSOs through our work with the Leadership Institute. Um, so I just wanna stress that this is, this is not a one-stop shop. Um, it's just a starting point so that you can dig deeper and learn that language um, for diving into the topics and the concepts that seem most relevant to your organization growth and, and building more inclusive and equitable garden spaces. Um, so now I'm just gonna pass it to Eva so that she can wrap us up with like a, a real tangible um, example of how Grow, Grow Pittsburgh navigated a similar scenario um, in supporting teachers with a train the trainer model. Thanks, Lauren. Yeah, so uh, what Lauren was explaining in that hypothetical situation was actually um, brought up from a real life situation that had happened at uh, the organization that I work for, Grow Pittsburgh where we have a lot of school garden programs where we work with teachers and students in school gardens. And there was a situation where um, in one of our earlier um, programs or earlier parts of our model of one of the, uh, the school gardens was that um, we came to a space, garden educators came to a space where there were teachers and students and there majority, 99% of the students, if not 100% of the students were of African descent and the teachers from the school were majority Euro uh, white uh, descent and students were of a, you know, they were totally engaged, really, really just, you know, they were thriving in the garden space. It was a place that they wanted to be. It was a learning space. It was a place where students that normally, you know, maybe they weren't thriving in the classroom at the desk seat sort of a space, but this is where they were really coming into their own. And even in that space, some of the students were um, making remarks and joking around with each other and poking, uh, making remarks about feeling like enslaved people in the garden space. And a number of the teachers had just either, you know, dismissed that remark would not um, know how to say anything about it. So they would remind students, you know, get back on task, focus on what you're supposed to be doing here in the garden sort of space. And that seemed like such a huge missed opportunity, not even to mention the whole, um, we need to listen to what youth are saying. There's a reason why they're saying these things. There's lived experience, there's, 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 ex familial experience there are these um all these different ways in which we pass down all of these feelings and histories of what has happened and so um it was a missed opportunity and so the garden educators and i had gotten together and we realized whoa the garden space is not just about growing beans it is so much more than that and so we decided um and i had wished that we had these resources to tap into in order to use in the way that we were going to change our teacher trainings because in that 
um, in, in that sense, we were doing a lot of teaching with the teachers, teaching the teachers how to teach in the garden space. And so I would have taken uh, a lot of the resources here. So as um, Lauren had mentioned, had, as Hudit had mentioned, there's the um, in section, the section five around uh, liberatory spaces for youth and um, professional development. There's the teaching styles, there's pedagogy, there's like highlighting the way you bring curriculum into the space to have these equitable conversations. That's one way to do it. Um, another way to overall to look at it, I also thought you can go to each section and you could go and just look at the youth section. If you notice at each topic, there's youth, uplifting youth voices each time. And you can look in there and go and find those resources. So it's there's many ways that you can dance around how you would use this resource and what makes sense to you. And I keep seeing it as this cyclical sort of thing. It's not just one and done, you're finished. It's not checking off a box and you're finished. It's finding all the different categories that we need to have uplifted and include equity into it. And so you're having your, your student voices where you're making sure that we were including what the students were saying, listening to what they were saying. Why do you feel that way? You know, what in your family history makes you say that, you know, and having those conversations with the students. We were talking about well, different professional developments for the teachers that involve um, how to add more culturally sensitive um, information in their lessons or how to even check their own biases of where they're coming from and why they feel so uncomfortable. So, um, yeah all of those different ways in which you can engage and share and participate in all of the resources here are really awesome. And so, yeah, just making sure that realizing too, that this is a living document. This can, it's going to change. We're gonna add things as time goes on because the dialogue changes, what we learn changes. And so it's very exciting to have you all here. I'm really glad you were, you found this as something important and crucial for us to participate in and change. And so, um, yeah, I, I, I'm really grateful to be a part of this and I'm really grateful for all of you being here. So all of these things are gonna keep changing, keep checking back, keep think, you know, suggesting, adding, ad adapting and changing so that we can truly truly make these larger picture changes that we are all ready for. So I can pass it on to um, Whitney, right? Yeah. Yes. Thank Thanks you. so much, Eva. And um, everyone, I want to just echo Eva's gratitude to you for being here and prioritizing this and also just huge gratitude to our presenters today and the larger working group that compiled these resources. I just find what you all achieved incredible in a week's time to pull so many useful resources and organize them in a way that we can find them and create meaningful change in our communities and in our work with these resources. Can't thank you enough. It's amazing. So thank you so much. Everyone, we'd love um, for you participants to take a survey just to let us know what you thought of today's webinar. So I just put that in the chat and you can also see that on the slide. And with that, we're now just going to open up for, we have just about seven minutes for Q&A. So, um, so I've got two questions in the, that people submitted in the Q&A. And then if we have time after that, you can unmute and ask other questions that you have of our panelists. So the first question is, are there specific grants or funding streams that would provide funding for external facilitators to work with our organization? And I see Tristana, that you volunteered to answer that question. Oh, yes, I did mark did it that way. Um, but I would love to hear if any other any of our other panelists have any suggestions. I did want to plug in Blue Sky Funders Forum. Um, they are an amazing um, just gathering of funders. And I know that in their most recent gathering, they really talked about the necessity to fund organizations in this type of process. So they aren't necessarily a funder themselves, but they gather other funders. So if you go to Blue Sky Funders Forum and check out their members, I know that a lot of those members 
um, those different funders are kind of on board with that kind of funding, whether or not they have specific programs that utilize that. But in terms of a good place to get started, just thought I'd mention that, but would love to know if any of our other panelists know of other resources. Thank you, Tristana. And before, I'm gonna pitch it to you, Hudit, but Tristana, I think there might be, if you look in the chat, it sounds like there's an issue with the survey. So maybe you can take a look at that. And Hudit, ideas on the funders? Yes, in terms of the funding, we highly recommend that you also uh, connect with your current funders, especially if there are fund foundations, oftentimes opening up a conversation with them or even individual donors. Sometimes you can say, this is a need. This is something that we're seeing that we're needing to allocate time and resources. Would you be willing to join us on, on this journey to both learn and shift what we're doing in our organization? So open up those conversations. Thank you, Hudit. Any other panelists have any thoughts on this idea about funding streams for working with external facilitators? Um, I would just want to back um, double up on what Hudit said as far as I think speaking as someone who's fundraised for uh, this type of organization for years, it is something that funders at first did not put um, as much of an emphasis on. So I think the more we go to our funders and say that this is important, the more likely they'll start uh, hearing us and, and understanding that this is really important for our whole uh, school garden community. And maybe that'll shift how they do some of their funding. I've already seen that starting to happen more and more. So I think part of it is uh, including them in the conversation. Thank you, Rebecca. All right, the second question that came in says, do you have experiences, resources, or recommendations for inclusive working in school gardens with physically and mentally disabled children? And John, if you could stop sharing your screen for a moment, I'd love to share my screen. And um, I can just show you in our, I'm so glad that somebody asked this question because in our, on our webpage, oh, which I have to find for a second, um, but on the webpage, there's actually a whole section on this. So here it is. Okay, I'm gonna share this screen. So on the equity focused webpage here that we've been going over today, in the section on creating learning environments, under resources, building liberatory spaces, um, here's a list of resources on building liberatory spaces. And some include how to design an accessible garden, designing a garden for youth with autism on, with autism spectrum disorder, designing for healing spaces. So there are a variety of resources there that I wanted to highlight right away on the webpage. Um, panelists, do you have any other resources that you'd like to highlight for that question? I think it would be worth mentioning that when you scroll down to the bottom of that website that we shared, there's additional resources there. And so th those are just like some, some topics have so much great information out there that it's really nice to just take a little peek there and see what would be great to, to use, tweak, you know, adjust for what you're doing. Um, um, we just, you know, couldn't live without putting it in there, but it didn't quite fit under each category. So we had to put it in there, but definitely check under there. Thanks, Eva, for highlighting that. And I'll just note then at the very bottom, here's a link for a form. If you have a resource, if you're a participant out there and you're like, wait, I have a great resource on that. There is a way for you to contribute so that we can keep growing this resource. All right, the third and final question in the Q&A box right now um, says, is there a resource that speaks about classism as that intersectional place between race and income diversity and inequity that might be used or considered in garden practices? Panelists, does anything come to mind there? And participants, feel free to add in the chat if something comes to mind for you too. Could you ask the question one more time? Yeah, it's basically, is there a resource that speaks about classism and the intersection between race and income diversity and inequity? Do you know of any resources that address that directly? I know that there is Isabel Wilkerson's book called cast that was phenomenal we didn't put that in the in the website it's a it's a book a, uh you know hard copy or you can get it on kindle or something like that but that addresses a very interesting comparison between um casteism in uh india with the enslaved history in the united states 
with Nazi Germany. And it was very interesting how all three of them kind of encouraged each other for lack of a better word and like built on certain types of um, human fears and insecurities and how we need to move past that. But yeah, Isabel Wilkerson had a marvelous book called Cast. Great. If Thanks, Eva. And I yeah. see Hudit also put in another book into the chat, which those sound great. Thank you. All right. Um, before we close, I just want to mention a very exciting event coming up on April 27th at 10 a.m. Pacific time. We're going to have a national coast to coast school garden tour virtually with stops at school gardens across the country um, from Hawaii all the way over to Washington, D.C. And it should be really fun. And it's something that you can tune into with children, with your students. You can send it out to schools and educators and teachers. Um, so share it far and wide. We'll include the details in a follow-up email, but I wanted you to know that it's coming at the end of the month, April 27th, and it should be an amazing day of national celebration of school gardens. And with that, um, Tristana, is there anything else before we close? Nope, thanks okay. so much for being here. Thanks everyone so much. Please do fill out that survey if um, the link now works, yes? Great. And thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you to our panelists. Amazing job. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody.